because this will be useful. So one is a delta, it gets to one, and then there's sort of a nice progression. The unit goes to one over s, and the ramp, which is t u of t, is going to go to one over s square. And so this is, the unit step is the integral of the delta. So the delta looks like this, and the unit step looks like that. So, and then the ramp looks like this. Okay, so obviously this is the integral of that, and we're gonna see that, we see that we're multiplying the one over s, so dividing by s each time, and we get these three, okay, just out of that. And similarly, to differentiate, we, divide, we multiply by s each time, we differentiate ramp, we get unit, if we differentiate unit, we get delta, okay? So those three you get more or less for free. And the other one that's important to remember is e to the um, alpha t uh, ut, uh, whose Laplace transform is one over s minus alpha. And this one over s minus alpha form is very, very important because um, when we have any polynomial and we find the roots, uh, what, is it, what, what do the roots look like? We can take any, with the, 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 you know, the fundamental theorem of algebra says we can take a polynomial, we can break it up into uh, factors, right? Each factor looks like this. So if I have some polynomial uh, one, uh, you know, let's say uh, polynomial P of S, this is equivalent to, uh, it'll be some set of roots S minus alpha one, S minus alpha two, etc. It'll turn out that what we really care about is uh, inverse polynomials, one over P of S, and so it'll become something like that. And then this using partial fraction expansion, which we'll talk about later, will be basically a sum of these one over S minus alpha, which will turn out to be a sum of exponentials like that, okay? So again, I'm giving you a little bit of preview of what we're gonna see uh, in control theory is that it'll turn out that what we care about is, uh, uh, is, is the denominator polynomial of the system, and then that will become a sum of uh, one over S minus alpha forms, which becomes sum of e to the alpha t forms. And so uh, this particular transform, e to the alpha t goes to one over S minus alpha, it's one of the most commonly used uh, things that we'll see, okay? All right, any questions about this so far? Okay. Let me show you the last couple, and then we can do the, uh, the homework exercise. So the uh, sine, so sine of omega t, ut, and the transform for that is s over, uh, sorry, omega over s squared plus omega squared. And the cosine of omega t, ut, that goes to s over s squared plus omega squared. And for both of these, by the way, I should say re s is greater than zero, is the region of convergence. And I think one of the questions that came up in class was what's the region of convergence for cosine? If you remember, the way we solved this was to look at the Euler formula and to expand it as a sum of two ex complex exponentials. Now, the, 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 uh, what it looks like is something like this. I'll just show you. Um, so just one of them is going to be integral zero to infinity because of the ut, uh, e to the j omega t, uh, e to the minus st dt. So this e to the j omega t, okay, is basically a phasor, okay? It's a phasor whose magnitude is one, okay? So the largest value it attains is going to be one. It's never going to be greater than one, okay? That's one important thing to rem remember. It's never going to exceed one no matter what. So as long as s is greater than zero, okay, e to the st is going to push that constant down to zero over time, okay? Because we have a constant, we can multiply by e to the minus st, and that's where the region of convergence is real s is greater than zero, because this is really, a, can think of it as a constant of magnitude one, okay? And so that's what we have uh, for the sine and the cosine. And so now sine of k omega t, Okay, it's just now going to be the scalar multiple. Okay, so it's going sort of k times faster. And so its transform is going to be one over k. Uh, uh, and then we're going to have, we're going to divide this by this, it's omega 
oh, sorry, omega over k by s square plus omega by k square. Okay. That's the uh, that's the answer because you're dividing. Uh, this is the transform for k. Uh, x of a t sorry x k t goes to one over k capital S of. Uh, oh wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. What am I doing? Omega over s by k square plus omega square. Sorry. I think, yeah, what we're doing is we're basically going uh, x of kt transform is x of 1 over k x of s by k. So we replace s by s over k, not omega. <laughs> sorry. Okay, so. That's, uh, that's, that's what we do over here. Any questions about that? Yeah? I think, or you can just replace omega by k omega, you get the same answer. If you replace omega by k omega. Uh, yeah, sh we can think of it as, uh, let me see. You replace the same thing by uh, k omega. Yeah. Yeah, you can view omega as being sort of the formal parameter and multiply k omega, I guess. But this is the way I would like to see you do it. <laughs> okay, that's sort of the formal way of doing it. Right. Yeah, you'll get the same answer, I suppose. Yeah, because it, it's a constant term. <laughs> okay, uh, I think that's about it. So the last thing I wanted to do was to solve the system using the Laplace transform, just to show you how easy it becomes now. So we have a system like before the Fourier transform and this system I'm going to give you the uh, h of s already the h of s is 1 over s plus 2 and the input is going to be uh, e to the minus t u of t. So the answer is what the question is what's the output look like and so with the Laplace transform the output becomes really easy to do. Remember to do this in time domain uh, well First of all, this, this 1 over s plus 2 corresponds to sort of e to the minus uh, 2t, right, ut is basically what that would be in the uh, time domain, okay. I'm just giving you the, uh, uh, so uh, you have to kind of take the convolution of these two and figure out, you know, the region of where the non-zero, et cetera, et cetera, it's a pain in the neck. Instead, with the Laplace transform, we simply say this one, e to the minus t, is uh, going to be 1 over s plus 1. So that's minus 1, so that you get the plus 1 over there because of the transform. Uh, where did I put it now? Okay, e to the minus alpha t corresponds to 1 over s plus alpha. So uh, because of that, we get this uh, very straightforward form over here. Or did I write it this way? I wrote the other way. I don't remember what I wrote it now. Plus or minus. But well, I said. Uh, e to the alpha is s minus alpha. It's the same thing. e to the minus alpha t is 1 s as for alpha or e to the alpha t is 1 over s minus alpha. Either way, it doesn't matter. So uh, here we have this input and we have this as a system. So the output will just be the product, which is going to be 1 over uh, s plus 1 into s plus 2. And so we want in the, in the, fre in the frequency domain. So the partial fraction turns out to be 1 over 1 plus s minus 1 over 2 plus s and again we'll see why that is later on and so we take the inverse transform we just get yt equals e to the minus t minus e to the minus 2t ut and the ut is just because it's positive time domain and that's uh, that's it that's as simple as that and if you go back and check with the Fourier transform we used essentially the same approach to solve it using Fourier transform and got the same answer as well. So it's the same system, so obviously it's the same answer. <laughs> and what we see is this is essentially two exponentials that are decaying, one slow and one fast, and then the difference between the two of them is really what the system is doing over here. Okay? So you can see that solving a system using Laplace is very straightforward. Uh, just compute the transform of the input multiplied by the transform of the uh, transfer function and you get the product form, in this case in the denominator, expand by partial fractions, take the inverse, and we get this over here. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. Uh, at this point, I'm going to take a, a 
So stop with the Laplace transform and start with the uh, discrete Fourier transform. So before, so I want to, yeah. Uh, yeah. What is the difference of decaying? What does it actually mean? Does the effect actually decrease or decrease? No, the effect is, see, this is uh, slowly uh, decaying compared to this. That's decaying very fast because the exponent is minus 2, right? So, so e to the minus t looks something like this. And e to the minus 2t looks something like that, right? So the gap between the two is basically what it's going to be, uh, OK? So if you want to compute, uh, uh, yeah? No, what I was asking, uh, how will the effect of the difference, yeah. will the effect be uh, lesser than each of these components, or will be more? OK, so the another way of answering it is let's use the final value theorem. What's the final value of yt? The final value of yt is going to be s, okay, limit s tends to 0, s times this, right? Which is just 0, right? Because it's, this is, uh, you, you could 0 over 0 minus 0 over 2. 0 over 1 minus 0 over 2, which is 0. So the final value of this is 0, right? So I can prove it to you graphically, but I can just invoke the final value theorem and you get it kind of automatically. Uh, the other way of thinking it is this is going to zero anyway. So there's no, even if I take this away, if I even set this value to zero, it's still going to zero. So this is going to go faster because I'm subtracting something from it. That is, something is sinking to zero, but making it go faster to zero with a, uh, subtracting something from it is only going to make it go faster. It can't r start rising up again. It's, it's continues to sink. Okay. Any other questions? But by the way, you can see how the final value theorem helps us to answer that, you know, right away. Yes, a question? No, okay. Okay, let's uh, uh, switch gears now, and I'm going to give you sort of the uh, high level view and then the details of the uh, uh, discrete Fourier transform and tell you where it's coming from and what's going on with it. So. Okay, so the uh, <clears throat> discrete Fourier transform is operating on something very different from the Laplace and the Fourier transform. Okay, the, if you let's kind of remember what we, where we started from. We had a, a periodic continuous function of time, which was x of t, and from there we got the Fourier series. Okay, Fourier said this is the series, and it's a sum of uh, sines and cosines. And then we could see that could be written in the form of complex exponentials. Okay, great. Then we said, okay, what if it's not periodic? If it's not periodic, we're going to have to take the limiting case of the period going to infinity, and we got the Fourier transform, which is great, except that the function has to satisfy the Dirichlet conditions. So we say, okay, uh, what, what do we do about that? Okay, we're going to force it down to go to zero. Even it's non if it's not absolutely integrable, we'll make it absolutely integrable by multiplying with this value e to the uh, sigma, e to the minus sigma t. When you multiply minus e to the sigma t, even a function that's not absolutely integrable is going to become integrable in the region of convergence, and so we get the Laplace transform. So all of these are still dealing with the continuous function. The function is either a periodic one that we saw earlier or an aperiodic one like this, but it's continuous. Here, we're going to do something different. We're going to deal with functions whose values are defined only at these discrete points in time, okay, which are positive or negative points in time. Okay? And so we have value here, we have value here, we have value here, whatever, and okay, whatever the values are. These are some values, and in between, they're not defined. Okay? They aren't defined. We don't know what it is. It has no value. It's a function which is only defined at discrete points in time. So we call this period between the two, we, def we give it the value capital T. And so we write the symbol, we write instead of x of t, we're going to write it as x of square bracket n t, where n is an integer. So minus infinity is n equal to n, is n equal to infinity, n is belongs to the, the integers. It's not a real, it's an integer, okay? So this function, is not a continuous function. It has these 
obviously it has these discontinuities. In fact, at every point in time it's discontinuous because you only have the point values defined over here. Okay, if you want to make it look easier to see, you can think of it like this. And so one would ask, why do we bother with these functions anyway? You know, why do we want to deal with this when you want to you know, start using continuous functions of time? And the answer is because uh, in digital systems, this is what we actually have. Okay, when we have a, any kind of digital system, we are always going to be uh, representing a continuous function of time with its digital uh, sample. Okay, we have a continuous value, some continuous value, and we're going to sample it. And then certain things are by their very nature, you know, digital, okay? And uh, uh, so uh, digital meaning that they occur at periods at particular, so I haven't told you what these values are, by the way. These could be any real value, okay? That would still make it, uh, if I, I haven't said that these are going to be quantized. So this is uh, discrete time, right? They're not, it doesn't have to be that these values are quantized, but in computer systems, typically not only is it discrete time, but also these values are going to be chosen from a particular set. Let's say I'm representing it by a float value, then there's only a certain number of floating point values. Okay, they're very finely spaced, but you know, it's, there's only a certain number of them. If using 32 different values, and I have two to the 32 different, uh, two to 32 different points over here, or if it's a double or float, whatever it is, I only have a certain number, discrete number of values I can represent. But setting that aside, we're focusing now only on the time, okay? Because this could be any real value. This is still the real, this is still real. But the time instants are quantized x of nt, okay? So we're focusing on this time. And so we have, in some sense, a sampling process going on. So we can think of the following things. Some, something is moving continuously with time. And we have a flashing light, like a stro you know, if you've seen these disco lights, you know, these flashing stroboscopic effect, right? Stroboscope. What it is is just a light, and in front of you, you have a disc that's rotating, and every time there's a, and there's a disc with a hole in it, like so. Okay, and that's the hole. And then every time the hole passes in front of the light, you get a flash of light coming out of it. So I have a continuous movement, but you're seeing it as a stop action, okay? Like a, like a, like a movie, okay, where you have this stop action. Okay, so. Is that clear? I'm trying to get, I'm just explain to you what X of NT means. Because it's, it's just notation. But what you should be thinking in your mind is some continuous quantity, okay, who, who, which that we, whose, whose value we are determining only at these specific points in time. Okay, any questions about this so far? Okay. So the fundamental, the fundamental thing you have to remember here, which is very, very important, is that the degree to which we are able to accurately reproduce the original continuous movement depends on the value of t over here, okay? Depends on the value of t because uh, I don't know what's happening between values of t. So if there's something is moving, but it moves faster. So if in one value of t it's doing something crazy and I don't see it. So let's take a very, very specific example just to show you what I mean. So I'm going to show you two functions. This is x1 of t, a continuous function. x2 of t is also a continuous function. And I'm going to do the following thing. So this one looks like this. And this one, it looks like that. So you're going to say, oh, these are completely different uh, functions, right? One is a sort of a sinusoidal and the other one is a constant. But what I'm going to do is, I choose the sampling times to be these ones over here, these vertical times over here, and let's say, okay, this, so this is the value t over here is the same. From the perspective of x of nt, the x of nt, okay, this is x of uh, zero, let's say this is uh, zero, one, minus one, minus two, etc. These are the only points I'm gonna get. The x's over here, and the x's over here, and they look the same, okay? They look exactly the same. So because of this, we have to be careful. What we'll be careful about is that if we have to choose this sampling period to be short enough so that we're capturing everything that's important about that, okay? Okay, we have to choose a small enough, so, because if you choose it too slow, what we see is not what's actually happening. There's something crazy going on, but we don't see it, 
Okay, we have a sinusoidal, but you're reporting it as being constant. Or other, I should say, you can't differentiate between a constant and something that's going on over here. So intuitively what's happening is that this has got some, uh, let's say it has some behavior, okay, which is faster than the sampling periods. Okay? And what we'll see in the next class is that this quote-unquote behavior is the, in the frequency domain is how wide its spectrum is in the frequency domain. In other words, you take the, when I take the uh, frequency, when I take the transform of this, I want to know its bandwidth. Okay, I want to know its bandwidth, and it will turn out that the sampling over here corresponds to a particular frequency. And I'll actually write it down for you. It's called omega s, and omega s is just 2 pi over t. Okay, it's the intrinsic frequency corresponding to sampling. It's just 2 pi over t. So we have the same omega to t transform as before. And this omega s tells us sort of the, the frequency of sampling. And as long as all the interesting behavior has a band limit within omega s, okay, plus minus omega s actually, uh, then you'll find that you're able to re reproduce it properly. But if you aren't, you're going to be in trouble. Okay? So uh, I'm going to tell you the practical implications of this, and then we'll take a break. So the practical implications of this have to do with the representation of voice. Okay? And so maybe I will. Uh, just spend a minute describing that. Uh, until about uh, 1870, 1860, something like that, uh, maybe 1880, uh, people were kind of confused about how to reproduce voice, okay? Because it was very important to reproduce voice. By uh, 1840 or so, 1845, already people had you know, telegraph wires. You could send Morse code, you could do zeros and ones, right? Across. And people were sending ships across the Atlantic to lay these wires on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean because if they could link New York and London, they could send you know, financial information, news, whatever, and it, you could make a lot of money okay, because it was much faster than, than, than the ship, which was the only other alternative at that point in time. But of course, everybody wanted to see, oh, could we send voice? It's even more interesting to do that. But the way they were trying to do it was they were trying to actually make these uh, uh, systems that reproduce the human vocal tract. They would make, you know, vibrating chords and, you know, all sorts of crazy things. If you look at the patterns from the 1860s on, you know, voice apparatus, uh, apparatus it would, we would find that uh, it was just crazy. What the, the fundamental breakthrough that Bell had, and Alexander Graham Bell, the fundamental breakthrough he had was, we don't need anything really complicated. All we need to do is to take the voice, which looks something like this. OK, maybe it doesn't go below 0, but whatever. It looks like this. And just sample it fast enough. OK. And uh, he actually wasn't sampling it. It was analog. But uh, what we do today is to sample it. But the, the uh, principle is still the same. The principle is that each value over here, as long as we have a mechanical device that can produce sound at that particular amplitude, we don't really care about what's being spoken. We don't really care whether it's a low pitch or a high pitch or a male or a female or five different things are going on at the same time. All we care about is that we've just got a particular amplitude at that point in time. So this is actually a very big deal because imagine the following way of transmitting uh, sound or uh, falling way of, of playing a CD. So you have a, a, a symphony orchestra and you have, let's say, 100 instruments. Okay, You could say, okay, this instrument now is going to play and that instrument is playing with this volume and this instrument is playing at this volume, etc. Right? It's playing this chord. this, And that's what you would do with what's called a harmonic analyzer, which is what people were trying to build at that time. And Bell said, no, no, all you do is tell me what the amplitude is of the sum of all the instruments. Just show me this amplitude right here. And I'm just going to send that amplitude value over and play that amplitude. And guess what? All the music is going to appear at the other end as if I had done the harmonic analysis. Okay? So it's not intuitive that this is going to work. <laughs> okay? It's not at all intuitive that it's going to work, that I can simply measure the amplitude of the uh, signal the combined signal and reproduce it 
and you'll get a symphony orchestra, right? Because you would think that, no, I mean, I have a drum that's playing and I have this cymbal and there, you know, one, one is very bass and the cymbal is very high, yet uh, uh, all Bell said was, no, just, just give me the total amplitude and we're going to send the amplitude over and that's what it is. So his instrument, as it turned out, was absolutely trivial. It was just measuring the amplitude by varying the resistance and the current that flowed through the wire depended on the varying resistance and the varying resistance was produced by and it, more or less like this there was a there was a, a wooden container and inside the wooden container he had mercury actually he had a mercury thing and on top of it he had a membrane which was i think oil paper as far as i remember and there was a wire that f that went into the uh, into the mercury and so basically the wire is a bare naked wire and uh, whenever you spoke the wire would vibrate right and so the current would go through the wire and come out through the mercury and the further it dipped into the mercury the less resistance there was right so the sound vibrations would come and the thing would vibrate up and down and what you're going to get is an electrical current modulated by the voice okay and he actually had a, a cone shaped thing over like so and a battery, and this electrical current was exactly this analog signal. And he would take this exact thing, and then what he did was on the other side was that he had uh, an electromagnet and a speaker and a diaphragm, and then this magnet was, and there's a magnet attached to the diaphragm right there, this electromagnet attached over here. So this electromagnet is attracting the magnet over there, attached to a little bit of vib vibrating diaphragm. So when the current was greater, the diaphragm was pulled in closer because the electromagnet was stronger and the current was weaker, the magnet was able to, because the natural elasticity of this diaphragms go away, and so you could, you would, you would have that. You could actually build it at home, except that mercury is poisonous and you have to break a lot of thermometers to get it, but other than that, you could build something like this, you know, probably you could put salt water, which is also a conductor. And uh, he built this literally, you know, he and his, he and his, uh, I guess his assistant Watson uh, built this in, in, in Boston and uh, they didn't need any harmonic anal an analyzer. They didn't need to figure out the frequencies. All they did was they, they had a varying current and you had, could have symphony orchestra playing here, you could hear it on the other side, okay, without doing analysis. So what's going on? What's going on is essentially that this signal X of T that you have over here uh, contains all the information about the entire orchestra, okay? As long as you play it or properly. So now we get into this interesting part over here. So that's fine for analog, it's fine for analog, but what about when you're going to send digital stuff, okay? How fast do you need to sample it? And so we need to make sure that uh, a, a sinusoidal wave coming out from, let's say, a clarinet is not going to be replaced by a flat thing over here because we don't have, you know, this is just constant, you know, tone. Right. So, so this is really what we're going to study with the discrete time Fourier transform. Discrete time Fourier transform basically tells us what's going on when we do this kind of sampling and the practical consequence comes from sampling voice which comes from the original analog transmission to convert that into digital transmission. Okay. So it's a lot of history behind this. Okay. Any questions about this so far? All right, so I, I don't know that I should, this is sort of a story, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> pretend it's a story. It, it is a story, right? Uh, I'll tell you the other part of it, which is kind of interesting, uh, which, 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 uh, which really is a story. Okay, so which is that Bell was this crazy guy. Okay, he was really, he was, like, he was crazy, he was brilliant and he was crazy. And uh, so he got, uh, he got into, uh, he got into a uh, telephone more or less by accident. He was trying to teach uh, people who are deaf how to speak. And he was trying to invent machines that would teach them how to hear properly and he was inventing all these things. And then he kind of stumbled upon this, uh, this particular problem uh, because uh, either his fiance or his wife, I don't know exactly what was at that point, she was deaf. And so he wanted to help her and he kind of invented this. He was only 22 or 23 at that time. He, was, he, he grew up, he was born in Scotland, but he came to Canada, became a Canadian citizen, and he was, growing, he was in Brampton, and he was in Boston, apparently, working on this experiment, and he took a break 
for the summer and uh, there is some farm in Brampton where apparently he's sitting in uh, sitting under this tree and you know like Newton he had this inspiration that you know to send all this information you just need a varying current and he went back to Boston and built it uh, there's a long story about how Edison had the same idea on the same day actually not Edison, Elisha Gray, I got Elisha Gray the same day had the same idea, went to the patent office, but Bell got there about a couple of hours earlier on the same afternoon and filed his patent and, uh, and Gray lost out and Bell won. So now it's called the Bell Telephone Company, not the Gray Telephone Company because after 20 years of patent disputes, the, uh, the uh, courts ruled in the favor of Bell. But there's another twist to that, which is that Bell actually went twice to the patent office. He went in the morning and filed something which wouldn't work and then Gray filed something and then Bell came back and said, no, no, I just thought about it, I'm going to revise it. And he revised it to be exactly what Gray had done. <laughs> okay. And so Gray said, no, he stole my idea. But so, no, Bell said, no, it couldn't be because I didn't see your patent. But uh, the story has it, you know, he had his spies, you know, it was a very big deal. You know, people were uh, very much uh, spying on each other and so on. So anyway. Uh, uh, there's a very long and complicated story that uh, I happen to know a lot about because I used to work for Bell Labs and I, I learned about it. But anyway, uh, Bell became very rich, very, very rich, very, very fast. Okay, uh, in his, When he was 28 or 29, he basically was so rich he didn't know what to do with his life. And the company that he started, Bell Telephone Company, didn't want him around. You know, it happens to a lot of founders. The companies don't want them around. So they said, okay, go do something. So he went and bought this farm in uh, Nova Scotia, I believe. And a uh, big farm, because he had nothing to do. He was, he was 30 years old. And so the next 40 years, he started doing really crazy things. Like one of the things he got into was flight. And he built these very large uh, kites. And uh, he was trying to get into you know, manned flight, you know, heavier than their machines. And so he would take his gardener and strap him to the kite and actually fly him into the air. Okay, with these uh, very interesting looking kites. There's some photographs of a very scared looking man attached to a kite being hoisted into the air, you know, a couple of hundred meters or whatever, you know, on the end of this line, uh, because Bell did that. But even more interesting, in the 1920s, you know, when he was in his 70s, he decided to get into speed racing on boats. So the world uh, water speed record, you know, the fastest uh, jet boats uh, was held by Bell. You know, at the age of 76 or something, he was going, I don't know how many, <laughs> like 100 kilometers an hour or something like that on, the, on, on, a, on a boat that he designed and built and uh, in this farm in Nova Scotia. So he had the water speed record as well in the 70s. So he was a crazy guy. <laughs> okay. Now that we've got that out of the way, I can tell you a little bit more about this. So, <clears throat> so... A lot of people were interested in sampling and what happens to discrete signals because this is how we do it on digital communication lines. And so we're going to spend basically a lot of time worrying about what should this capital T be. And so before we get there, I want to kind of tell you about the uh, something called the Dirac comb and how the Dirac comb helps us with uh, answering this question. So what we want to do is to somehow uh, figure out how to deal with this kind of discrete function because we haven't seen these before. We know continuous time, we know what to do, but x, the square bracket nt, you know, it's a new beast. So what do we do? So what we do is we convert it into something we've seen before. And to do that, we need to use a Dirac comb. So what's a Dirac comb? Well, we know what the Dirac delta is. The Dirac delta is just one thing over here. And if I just put the Dirac delta like this, it's called the Dirac comb. And these are just deltas that are spaced apart by t. OK, so I have a bunch of deltas. In fact, I have an infinite number of deltas. And uh, it's a very sharp comb, OK? <laughs> and, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it, it gives you this over here. So we call this the Dirac comb, or in, in my text, I, uh, I use a different thing. I call it the uh, impulse train. And you give it a symbol, which is S T of T, which is basically saying I have a, uh, I have a uh, S stands for sampling. And so I, I have a bunch of uh, Dirac deltas spaced by capital T, and that's a function of time, so it's S, T, of T, okay? That's what we have over here. All right, so 
is this, so this is hopefully clear. So now the question is, what's the Fourier transform of a Dirac comb? What's the Fourier transform? Well, what we do is that each of these has a Fourier transform. At zero, it has a transform of one. And then this one is time delayed by t, and this one is time delayed by minus t. So this one has a Fourier transform of e to the j minus j omega t. And this one is going to be e to the j omega t, OK? And this is going to be e to the minus j omega 2t, and so on, right? Because when we, we know that the uh, uh, x of t minus t, we, uh, the Fourier transform is e to the minus j omega t, OK? Uh, the Fourier transform of, uh, uh, so this is delta t minus t, the Fourier transform of delta, and that one is 1. Right? The Fourier transform of delta is 1. So the time delay by t okay, is going to give me e to the j omega t. And if a time delay by n capital T, it's going to be e to the j omega n t. So this Fourier transform is, can be represented as sigma n equals minus infinity to infinity. So it's a infinite sum of e to the minus j omega n capital T. Okay? So the n capital T is the, uh, this term over here is really just your time delay term. Remember, when you multiply, when you delay in time, you're going to multiply by e to the minus, in the Laplace case, e to the minus st naught. In the Fourier case, we multiply by j omega and t over here. So this, is this clear over here? So all I've done is to introduce something called the Dirac comb or the impulse train, and it's a train of impulses. And I've computed the Fourier transform of the impulse train from the linearity property of the, of, the, of the Fourier transform and the time delay property of the Fourier transform. OK? All right. So now I'm going to do one more step, which is to bring back x and t. So I have this x and t over here. I'm going to claim that x and t is equal to x t s t t. OK, so <clears throat> what am I saying over here? I know what this is, and I know what this is, but I haven't told you what x of t is. Okay? Okay, so let's assume that there exists a continuous function x t such that at every time instant n t, okay, its value corresponds to an x n t. In other words, I'm giving you these sample values over here. So let's go back to an example over here. And I'm only giving you these, these x's over here, like so, okay? So let me just draw a function. I said these are the x's like this. Now you take any function you want, okay? It could be anything, but as long as it passes through these points, okay, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, this is x of t. It's any old function that passes through those points. I'll call it x of t, but it's a continuous function, okay? So. This is what this equation means over here. I'm saying that I'm writing this x and t as a product of some arbitrary x t, which assumes these values, multiplied by the sample. So now we can give an interpretation to this. And the interpretation is that x square bracket nt is a sample of this continuous function x of t. Okay? And now we can do the following trick, which is to say, OK, if we know this, then let's see what is the uh, Fourier transform of this. Because if that's a Fourier transform, we can compute this Fourier transform. We should be able to get the Fourier transform of that. Because after all, you know, this is the same as that. Okay? So how do we get that? We know the Fourier transform of XST. Right? And now we have a, a trick which mathematicians hate, but engineers are going to do it anyway. So here's the, here's the trick, OK? Let's look carefully at this. ST is a sum of these terms, OK? Now, if you consider any one particular term, if you take any one particular term, let's say for n equals 5, for example, right? So e to the j omega 5t, OK? What we have over here, OK, is that we are going to basically multiply this, this function, this sample function is basically only looking at x of 5t, okay? 
Now this x of 5t is some value. It's some value, let's say this value over here. This is independent of time. Okay, it's just a particular value I just picked. And so we can view it as basically a scalar multiple of the, uh, of the function, of, of the function st over here. So in other words, I can think of this st as being a bunch of values, and then I'm multiplying out just the, let's say this is, this, this is 2t, so I'm just changing the height of this to be x of 2t. Okay, that's what we're doing. By, multipl by multiplying over here. So what will be the effect on the Fourier transform? The Fourier transform is just going to be taking this one over here, okay, and multiplying it out. This term is going to get multiplied. Uh, I'm going to take this out over here by x of nt. Because this corresponds to the Dirac Coombe at the value n capital T. This is a scalar multiple of S T. And so scalar multiple of, of Dirac delta is going to just go scalar multiple. I'm just multiplying by scalar value, right? Doesn't really change anything. And so I can claim that this is therefore going to be the Fourier transform of the function x of nt, okay? And I'm probably going to come back to this next time just to make sure you guys understand this. But this is in fact the discrete Fourier transform of x of nt. So I did it in two steps. I first said that uh, I know the Fourier transform of the Dirac comb, which is just some of this. And then second, I claim that x nt is just going to be represented in this way, and therefore the Fourier transform of this discrete function can be obtained as scaling the transform uh, of, the, of, the, of the comb by the scalar constant x of nt, and that gives me basically the discrete Fourier transform. So I kind of did it in a roundabout fashion, but uh, uh, that is it. Okay, that's one right there. So that's a discrete Fourier transform. So we got there through the continuous transform and the sample function, the impulse strain function. Okay, so uh, I would suggest you kind of go read section 5.10.2 uh, uh, carefully, and then I'll cover that. And next time we'll talk about aliasing and uh, onto a fast Fourier transform.